Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this episode of PIDC webinar on the topic of COVID-19 is our savior here. I am Dr. Fawaz, and I'm joined by my colleague and friend, Dr. Lari, and also by a very distinguished guest. Um, Dr. Lari will introduce our guest a little later. I just want to remind our viewers that this, view, uh, this webinar is part of Penang International Dental College's commitment to providing education beyond classroom setting, which is so relevant in this turbulent time. With cold vaccine coming into the picture of the ongoing global pandemic, uh, pandemic, the question now is, will the vaccine be a game changer? So without any delay, I request Dr. Lari to please introduce our guest so that we can get to the bottom of this question. Over to you, Dr. Lari. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, a very good morning, uh, Dr. Fawaz and uh, Professor Victor. Uh, we are indeed honored and happy to have uh, Professor Victor joining us today. Morning, Prof. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, Thank you very much, Fawaz. Thank you for yeah. the invitation. Professor Victor has years of experience in the field of public health and is currently heading the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. He's also a member of the task force for COVID-19 for University of Malaya Medical Center. Having vast experience in the field, he has lectured extensively and has many publications and accolades to his credit. Join me in welcoming Professor Victor. Prof. Thank you very much, Larry, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction. So I'll just start off with my presentation and hopefully you all would, would uh, benefit from it. All right, just tell me, you all can see the slide. Okay. So, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar by uh, Penang International Dental College. So, the lecture today is basically going to focus on COVID nineteen vaccine. Is our savior here? All right. So, we would try to try and show, try and present some information on what is vaccine and how can how are we going how is vaccine going to help us in basically managing the COVID nineteen pandemic. So good morning again. I'm Professor Dr. Victor Hall from the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. So oh, let's let's have a recap of what is COVID-19. COVID-19 is a novel co is caused by the novel cor coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. Cases first reported in Wuhan, China, uh, starting from December 2019, and the first case in Malaysia was diagnosed on 25th of January in a tourist from China coming in from Singapore. So we were very, very, uh, we, we in University of Malaya Medical Center actually have started to receive the first case, first uh, PUI, person under investigation, based on this, this uh, tourists who come from Singapore. So on the 26th of January, 2020, we started our task force on uh, COVID-19. We met to make, because we have one case that came in on the 25th of January. So we have been working since uh, 20. 6th of January 2020 to ensure that the safety and health of the workers in University Millennium Medical Center are ensured and make sure that they are safe from the COVID-19 pandemic. So understanding the disease, basically we know that, I think a lot of information we know already know now that the disease of COVID-19 is especially spread by droplet and aerosol and the most important co component is 85% of people who get the disease actually asymptomatic or they're asymptomatic when they get the disease and that's where they can spread. Basically, before two days before the symptom is where, where you're most infective and that's where you can spread the disease more easily. By understanding this, this uh, uh, risk, basically we will be able to know how can we control the risk and basically what is the, what's the role of vaccine as we're going to discuss further. So strategy to control or manage COVID-19, of course, we know there's a primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. Secondary primary prevention is to prevent the disease from occurring. Secondary prevention is prevent the is for early diagnosis and management and treatment. And tertiary prevention is basically on prevention of complication. So if you want to control or manage COVID-19, the best is look at primary prevention, how to prevention 
prevent the disease from spreading or from occurring or from, from propagating. So there are few, few uh, primary prevention strategy, include personal strategy, environmental strategy, quarantine, and vaccine. So the personal strategy include what, what we ask you all to do, the SOP, the uh, standard operating procedure like wearing masks, washing hands, social distancing. Those are all personal personal strategies. And don't don't be involved in a crowded area. Don't don't talk in a close close uh, proximity. And also don't 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 be in a confined confined space. So all those are personal strategy. Environment strategy is basically basically to ensure that the environment environment is safe, that the that the air, air circulation is good, so that we can all we have fresh air that coming in and and there's no stale air in the environment. So this this is an important component in the management of COVID nineteen pandemic. Actually, we have done a lot of this in the New City Medical Center to ensure that our, our environment is safe. To ensure that people outside of the environment, outside of the COVID nineteen uh, uh, management, are not being affected. So we are very proud that basically, although we have over two hundred uh, cases in the uh, University of Malaya Medical Center among our healthcare worker, uh, only around ten percent of the case basically are from uh, exposed by patient to healthcare worker, and and among those ten percent, basically, is because that. And the time the patient came in, we don't know that the patient is COVID-19. Once we know the patient is COVID-19 and all the PPE has been adhered to, basically, there's no there's no risk of transmission. So we have zero transmission actually from patient to uh, healthcare worker in the COVID ward. So actually, basically, by understanding the risk, by understanding the how to manage, how the personal, how the disease spread, basically, we were able to we were able to control the virus. We were able to control ensure that the safety of all our healthcare worker. So you must understand the safety of the healthcare worker is important to ensure that we have enough healthcare worker to be, to, to work in our healthcare system. So we, we spent a lot of time to ensure that healthcare worker is safe. So on, on personal strategy, like on what, what PPE to wear. So all those things, basically, we spent a lot of time. Of course, the other important component in, in managing uh, COVID-19 is basically looking at contact tracing, and identifying people people who are exposed to COVID nineteen patient, and then to make sure that they quarantine properly. So quarantine is a is a strategy that have been employed many many years ago, many many times, and on on different different infectious disease. But only currently in the COVID nineteen pandemic, it's become a big thing, and and everybody is being quarantined. Usually, when we talk about quarantine, we talk about people coming back from uh, countries which have yellow fever, have not been have not been uh, vaccinated for yellow fever, we will quarantine them. So this is the only time that we there's a mass quarantine that we we do because of a very infectious uh, disease, which is your SARS-CoV-2. So we must understand that SARS-CoV-2 is very infectious. So the best thing to do is we can identify all the contact early, identify all the people who basically consider as PUI or person under investigation, and quarantine them. We would be able to control the spread of the disease in the in the community or in the public. Of course, the other strategy is to be looking at vaccine. So, so we are basically talking about vaccine for the last one year, one and a half years, and only recently vaccine has basically come into has been has been deployed, and only around February, uh, late February or mid February, vaccine have comes comes into Malaysia. So the idea is, what is vaccine, and how can vaccine actually uh, prevent the disease? How can vaccine actually help us? To move forward from this current current uh, SOP that we are practicing, and whether vaccine actually would enable us to to go back to a normal situation. So let let us discuss on what is vaccine. All right. So vaccine comes from the Latin word vaccinus, which is mean cow. So why why did we name vaccine after cow? This time you must go back to that seventeen hundred when you basically. To understand where was the first vaccine being developed, so vaccine we developed first modern vaccine was developed or was discovered or basically was known by a, a person called Edward Jenner. So Jenner in 1976 actually inoculated cowpox in a 13 year old boy to prevent smallpox. So you were imagining that cowpox, basically cowpox, are um, a similar kind of uh, why why he did it is because he found that. Basically, the milk lady, those people, those ladies that milk cows, 
are, are basically protected from smallpox. So he was wondering why those 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 ladies that milk cows are protected from smallpox. Then he found that small uh, there is a there is a similar disease in the in the cattle industry basically called cowpox. And so by injecting cowpox into into uh, into a kids basically he was able to prevent smallpox. That's where the first vaccine is basically developed. What vaccine is being used? That's in 1796. And just to show you what is smallpox. Just to just to tell you whether where, where, if we are going to see this set of cases again, well, smallpox is actually a very debilitating thing, disease, and a lot of the people who get smallpox get very bad disease and basically die die out of the disease, and it's very very infectious. So without vaccine, we will not be able to eradicate smallpox. All right. So this this. Picture actually shows a child with smallpox in Bangladesh in 1973. So even in our lifetime, there's still smallpox. And only in 1980, we were able to eradicate smallpox in 1980. Eradication means that there's no human-to-human -human transmission anymore, and there's no smallpox, there's no community transmission. So the idea is the 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 main thing is why can we eradicate smallpox and not other diseases is that because smallpox only happen in between only happen because of human to human transmission so we can if we can actually find all the contacts isolate all the contacts or we can do vaccinate at people to ensure that people are vaccinated and people will get infected by smallpox we actually can actually eradicate smallpox from the world so that is very important we have done it already we might be going to do it again but that is what is smallpox. Of course, then Louis Petcher actually developed life attenuated cholera, uh, cholera vaccine in, in 1897 and also have an uh, inactivated entrance vaccine in 1904. So the, the vaccine development started off with basically either use life attenuated, that means you use vaccine, you use life, life virus or life bacteria and make it less harmless, less harmful, and then put the virus or bacteria in. And inject it into the human so that's one way to do it the other way to do it is basically you use inactivator that means you, you basically you kill them and then you put it into the into the human you inject in your clay or inject it into a human so there's either life attenuated or inactivated this is the these are the two main form of manufacturing vaccine for a very very long time and basically that is how how it happened so we talk about vaccination. Vaccination is not new to the country. We know that vaccination. We as know that starting from 1950, basically we have a what we call Malaysian national Malaysian national immunization program. So based on the it is based on the WHO uh, EPI or uh, immunization program. So it basically look at immunization against six childhood disease. But the Malaysia NPI actually focuses on. 13 major child disease. So there's immunization against 13 major child disease currently. So the 13 diseases are for tuberculosis, for diphtheria, for tetanus, for polio, for pertussis, for hepatitis B, for hemolysis influenza B, for measles, for mumps, for rubella, for uh, human papilloma virus or HPV, for pneumococcal, pneumococcal, and then for Japanese encep encephalitis. So these are the 13 diseases that we immunize in Malaysia. Of course, we don't immune, we don't give 13 13 needles every time. So we have basically one one uh, vaccine basically have six have six uh, different type of diseases that protect, and some vaccine have three different type of the diseases that they protect. And JE is only given in Sabah and Sarawak. It's not given in uh, Semenanjung. So basically, and of course, HPV is only given in females and not in males. So these are what we call the Malaysian Immunization Program. This is basically for, for kids starting from when you're born until around 12 years old. Basically, we continue to immunize you. That's why the Ministry of Health actually run a school health program and a school health program. Part of the, part of the role of a school health program is to look at immunization. So we basically look at immunization of the people by basically you doing that nation, Malaysian national immunization program so these are these are basically looking about 
immunization of the kids. So what happens when you're adults? Does an adult need to be immunized or not? Does when you go out, does do you need to be do you need to receive vaccination or not or immunization or not? Because I think most of here, most of you here basically are adults. So you wonder like, why do adults still need to be immunized? Basically, some of them we still need to be immunized. We need to be immunized because of the work we do or the exposure we have or the risk we have. So, so all this immunization basically is basically it's called risk-based immunization. And some of it is some of this is not for eradication of the disease, but basically for prevention of the disease or prevention of you getting the disease. Some of that you, you can some of the some of the immunization can be given for once in five years or once in a lifetime. Some basically you need to do it once annually, like your like your influenza vaccine. Influenza vaccine, you need to do it once annually, right? So we have anthrax, cholera, influenza, but then cococcus. Of course, if you're traveling to for your Hajj or for to to Arab to Arab country for your Hajj or for your uh, uh, for basically to the Arab country, you need you need to you need to get menococcus. Then hepatitis A, hepatitis B, plague, rabies, yellow fever, typhoid is for people who are actually handling food or food handlers. They need to be immunized against typhoid, varicella. Pneumococcus and Japanese encephal encephalitis. So pneumococcus is recommended for people, older people, to prevent them from getting bad uh, infection. So basically, this are uh, immunization is not new. Immunization is not only for kids. Immunization is for all everyone. And immunization actually have reduced the prevalence of the disease, have reduced the severity of the disease, have reduced you people from getting sick. You just 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 imagine if there's no immunization, what will happen? All right, very sim very simple, very simple analogy, very simple thing is that in among among the Chinese community, all right, we have what we call a full moon celebration. Why is there a full moon celebration? A full moon celebration happens because we know that to have a child live for one month, after one month, is that it's much more easy for them to live beyond that. And why is it so important at the time? Because there was no immunization and there's a lot of childhood diseases and these child diseases actually uh, basically start and then you get very bad and then you die before you reach the age of one month. So one month is an important milestone in the among the Chinese community. But because currently we have been immunized already, actually it doesn't, it, it is not very important. It's just a tradition that we practice to inform people. Usually, usually that is what happened in, in the past. But currently we do it because we have a way to prevent the disease from occurring. We have a way to basically save or ensure that our children are safe, our elderly are safe, our loved ones are safe. Immunization is the way to go if we have been immunized. So the question is, how long does it take to basically develop a vaccine on? So the typical timeline of developing vaccine, basically you need a preclinical trial, basically do it on animals and do it on human to basically find out what we call the, the, the candidate vaccine, the candidate candidate who basically is good for to become a vaccine. So it's called a preclinical trial. Once you find a candidate vaccine, then you develop it further, you do a pre, you do a phase one clinical trial, which takes another one to 10 years. Basically, phase one preclinical trial is look at, look at the safety, look at, Look at the efficacy, not looking at efficacy, but look, more looking at the safety. That will take another one to 10 years. Uh, uh, phase one clinical trial will basically, the, the number of people actually be smaller compared to a phase two clinical trial. A phase two, two clinical trial will look at the efficacy of the drugs to see whether how, when you, you compare phase one and phase two, and also it looks, it's further, it's further, further look at the, what we call the safety of, of, of the drug. And phase two, phase three basically is, is, is a larger clinical trial. We're looking at people, more people, and then to look at the community, looking at more general population, and basically that is that is where we look at uh, whether whether the the vaccine is really effective against against all other against in a larger population. And then after that, with all the information we have, we we send it for regulatory approval. And the, when when it's approved, then only we start to manufacture the the vaccine. That is a normal process. That's why it takes around 10 years for us to actually get the vaccine from, from, from the uh, laboratory until the vaccine is given as a routine in the community. 
the 10 years because everything happened linearly everything happened linearly that means everything happened one after another and after the regulatory approval we take another few years to develop the manufacturing capacity for us to manufacture the drug or we, we manufacture the vaccine so it takes a very very long time for us to achieve this uh, thing but currently the covid 19 vaccine we took only one year plus 12 months people with people are asking is it safe or not because we do it in such a short time what 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 safety measure has not been taken into account can we trust this vaccine or not well everything that you see here that takes a traditional typical typical uh, role of what vaccine is going to develop has been incorporated while we are developing the COVID-19 vaccine all right the only difference is that instead of instead of one thing happened after the other another we start phase one then after we have enough number to say that it's safe then we start phase two then we start phase three and then we go and regulatory approval and for this also what we call the manufacturing process actually starts after we start phase two when we know that the drug is safe and the the process the it, it is efficacious we start to manufacture the drug before it is being approved so the manufacturing process started before it's approved once the manufacturing process started and the approval goes through that's where we can basically can deliver the drug why can we do it like that this time is because the government has actually guaranteed that if your vaccine doesn't work we still pay for the post uh, for the development fees we've paid for the manufacturing fees so that is what the guarantee has been so 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 the company won't lose money the drug company won't lose money if the drug comes out and they started manufacturing and the and the drug actually is not working so they won't lose money so the idea is that everything happens not in a linear fashion but everything happens simultaneously so that's why that it takes one to two years for us to develop this COVID 19 vaccine and of course we put a lot of effort a lot of scientists actually actually put in a lot of effort to go and develop this vaccine in a very very short period of time so the idea is how many type of COVID 19 vaccine we have all right so just now we're talking about a uh, life attenuated or or in an activated vaccine so basically life attenuated or activated vaccines are basically called whole cell vaccine all right so we have basically three but covid 19 vaccine we can have four type of covid 19 vaccine we have nucleotide acid vaccine we have protein subunit vaccine we have vector vaccine we have whole virus vaccine so let's 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 dive into all these four type of vaccine and then get an idea of what this four type of vaccine is and what are the vaccine and then what advantages and what are these disadvantages of this type of vaccine let's start to look at nucleotide acid vaccine all right so it uses genetic materials like your dna and your, or rna and provide instruction for specific protein from the pathogen and trigger an immune response the idea is that this kind of mrna or dna is injected into your body and this mrna or dna tells the body to produce what we call antigen and that antigen actually trigger the immune response all right so example of this 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 drugs basically as it is your commonity your pfizer your biotech are is the mrna vaccine your moderna is the mrna vaccine so just to inform you all i have to have completed my vaccine first dose and second dose actually actually use commonity and i'm i i basically i was immune my second injection was on wednesday and now i'm talking to you although it's basically i am somewhere talking to you and it is basically it shows that there's not there's not no issue with the vaccine so nucleotide vaccine immune response involved b cell and t cell no life component relatively easy to manufacture some RNA vaccine require ultra cool storage of course we know that community require ultra cool storage of minus 70 degrees celsius and booster shot may be required so although i have received my second dose i may require another boost shot maybe nine months down 
where the level of basically immunity have decreased and that will basically again increase the immunity. Why this happened is basically the basically continue to develop, continue to manufacture the antibody antibodies against the COVID-19 vaccine. So this is what this is what a booster shot is required. Of course, we know that even for for the for the vaccine that we give our kids is always given in one, two, three shots for booster shot to make sure that you your immunity develop at such a level that basically it would be protective against against your COVID-19 uh, infection. The second, the second type of vaccine is the protein subunit vaccine. Basically, it's basically subunit of uh, the protein. Just now we're talking about DNA. DNA is basically a very, very small component of protein. Now we're basically we're talking about if it's not even a protein, we're talking about a subunit of a protein. All right, so subunit vaccine uh, is cellular vaccine contains purified pieces that have ability to simulate uh, immune response. So basically, these purified pieces go in to simulate the immune response for the body to produce the antibody. That the most important thing is that you must understand all vaccine works by your using your body immune response to produce antibodies. So other subunit vaccine include hep hepatitis B. Okay, I think most of you have hepatitis B vaccine already. Because you all are dentists, correct? You are dental. Dentists make, must have hepatitis B vaccine because you are exposed to needle stick injury all the time. And if you don't have hepatitis B vaccine and you have hepatitis B, you also cannot become a dentist to treat the patient because there you would infect patient because you, you are not you don't have you have hepatitis B. So the idea that you as a dentist you would have received hepatitis B vaccine and hepatitis B vaccine also you need a booster shot. Every five years, you need a booster shot. We also got the hay cellular pertussis vaccine, pneumococcal polysac polysaccharide vaccine. The example of uh, hepatite, uh, sorry, example of COVID nineteen vaccine that, that is protein subunit is your Novavax, all right? So Novavax vaccine is a subunit vaccine. So it's about established technology suitable for people with compromised immune system, no life component, relatively stable, relatively com. The issue is that the problem is relatively complex to manufacture. Adjuvant and booster shot, shot may be required. So most of the time, it's adjuvant or booster shot may be required. So don't worry about that. Everybody, we know that when you even to inject a vaccine, you need a booster shot or adjuvant. So the other one is vector vaccine. Vector vaccine is basically used another kind, another virus or back to actually, and you put in the component, you modify the virus, and you put in the component of the COVID-19 into the virus so that the virus itself simulate that you are infected by COVID-19 and they and your body will produce the antibodies, all right? So example is Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Cancer No Biology, or Sputnik V. So these are, these are example of vector vaccine. It's a well-established technology, strong immune response. Immune response involves B and T cell, previous exposed to vector could reduce e efficacy. What do you mean by previous exposure to vector? Let's say we're using uh, adenovirus, and if you're exposed to adenovirus already, it might reduce you to the effectiveness of the vaccine because the body actually have produced immunity for adenovirus. And then straight away, you would attack the adenovirus before actually they have time to come in and, and, and simulate the body immune response to produce more vaccine. And the other issue is it's relatively complex to, to manufacture. The last one, we have basically the whole, whole, whole virus vaccine. So we understand the whole virus vaccine can be live attenuated or can be inactivated vaccine. Of course, it's a tried and tested vaccine. This is how the vaccine is manufactured since it's the start of a vaccine itself. So example of what we have, the Sinovac vaccine, inactivated virus, or Sinopharm vaccine, which is in inactivated virus vaccine. So by established technology, suitable for people with compromised immune system, no life component. This is talking about inactivated vaccine, eh? not talking about the life attenuated. Life attenuated is different. So we're talking about inactivated vaccine and your Sinopharm and Sinovax is actually an inactivated vaccine. Relatively simple to manufacture, relatively stable, booster shoot may be required. So whatever vaccine you use, whatever vaccine, you still need a booster shot because we know that the immune system sometimes cannot sustain the immunity over a long period of time. You need a booster to, to simulate 
the infection again, and that will basically simulate the immune system to produce antibodies. So that's, that is what you need to learn about when talking about vaccine. All right. So these are, these are some of the, the COVID vaccine type that's, that's under development uh, generally around the world. So with whole virus vaccine, we have 15, protein sub you have 13, nucleotide 20, and viral vector 15 type of vaccine. Just to show you that there are so many, still so many vaccines that are still in the development and only we see few that basically currently is being deployed around the world. But there's so many, many vaccines still under development. And it is good for the country, it's good for us, good for humanity, because when you are developing vaccine, you're you're looking at new technology, you look at new way of new way of uh, delivery of healthcare, new way of new way of, of delivery of a drug. So the idea is there is a lot invested in this and coming out of this basically it benefits us also. So what is the vaccination program in Malaysia for COVID-19 vaccine? All right, so the most important thing we must remember that Malaysia have actually said, the Prime Minister have actually said that vaccine will be provided free for all citizens and non-citizens in Malaysia. Doesn't matter you are a citizen or non-citizen in Malaysia, if you are here, we will provide vaccine for free. Why do we do that? Some people ask, why do you want to waste money on non-citizens? Why do you don't want to waste money? Why do you want to, want to immunize non-citizens? Why do you want to immunize refugee? Why do you want to immunize people who come in to work? You know, why can't they do it themselves? Why can't the country do it? The idea is if you don't immunize all the people or if you don't get uh, herd immunity, there's no point of you immunizing because the disease will still be there. And when your immunity goes down a little bit, you will get infected. So the idea is you must ensure that there is herd immunity. When there's herd immunity, the chances of it spreading, the chances of it be becoming an endemic or a pandemic will be less. So not just Malaysia must immunize 70% of the population, but the world must immunize 70% of the population. So every country must do its bit to actually ensure that everybody in the country are immunized. So the more people immunize, the faster we will get out of this pandemic. So how much vaccine do we have? Community, we have 32 million doses. AstraZeneca, we have 12.8 million doses. Sinovac, we have 12 million doses. Can Sino Bio, we have 3.5 million doses. And Sponic, we have got 66.4 million doses. So is this enough or not? Yes, this is enough for all the citizens and non-citizens who is currently in Malaysia. The idea is please go out and register and get vaccinated soon. Register early and get vaccinated. So what is the vaccine distribution strategy? Of course, we're talking about frontliners. As I mentioned to you, I am a frontliner. I am in the front line in UC Millennium Medical Center to manage COVID-19. So I was have the privilege and they have given me first. I am lucky. I basically, I'm indebted that the, well, I was one of the first to receive the vaccine in UMMC. So now I basically have received my second dose. So I'm considered that my immunity have increased. I am much more, much more better, but I still practice my SOP. All right. So why we, we in, it, why we why we start with frontliners is to ensure that the healthcare sector continues to operate optimally. So that's the important thing. But before that, also we know that without vaccine, we also if we practice SOP, we basically can have optimum what. But with vaccine, basically, it's safer for the healthcare worker. We will make sure that healthcare worker will be safe at their workplace. Second is the high risk group, basically those people having comorbidity like hypertension, diabetes, uh, elderly. Those people we would like to immunize them first because we want to make sure that they don't get bad worse disease and they don't end up in hospital. They don't they don't take out our ICU bed because that is very bad for them, and the outcome is very bad. So it will reduce the burden of the disease. Also, it will reduce the load to the healthcare system. The third, of course, to for everyone to make sure that we can contain the the, the pandemic. If we have seventy percent of the people, eighty percent of the people immunized around in Malaysia, we would have a chance to contain the pandemic. So phase one, five thousand people. So priority group, public, private healthcare sector, 
essential services. This one is almost complete, and we're going to start phase two soon, around April. And phase two, basically, we we'll look at the 9.4 million people, group one priority, remainder of healthcare workers, essential services, defense and security, senior citizen, high risk group, and people with disability. Once we finish this phase two, then we move into phase three, where everybody else would be immunized. So, so the idea is we want to make sure that everybody is immunized. We want to make sure that the red zone move out and become a green zone. You know, of course, currently Selangor is in the red zone. We want to move Selangor out into the green zone. And it's very, very important to do that because if we have people immunized, then business can continue, life can continue. And the contribution to from the business is important for us to ensure that our livelihood is taken care of. So it's very important for us to do that. All right, frontliners. I think Sun has been said already. Okay, economic values of vaccination. Basically, when you vaccinate, it really reduces the fear of contagion. You can go out, and of course, you reduce the variety of diseases. You reduce a person's physical and financial risk in the pandemic. Reduction in uncertainty, increase in value of hope, reducing the risk associated with disease of vulnerable population. So. After vaccination, you would basically ensure that you're, you can go back to work, you will be confident of going back to work, and you're confident of you're not in fact when you come back from work, you'll not be subjecting your loved ones to the risk of COVID-19. We know that some of our loved ones are basically elderly and not subjecting our mother, our father, our grandmother, our grandfather to actually COVID-19 and they were high risk for dying from COVID-19. So the economic value of vaccination is very great and it's important for us if you are given the chance to get vaccinated. If you have not registered, please register so that you would get vaccinated as soon as possible when it's available. So what happened after vaccination? All right, the idea is vaccination will reduce the variety of the disease. Vaccination may not may not reduce transmission. This because, as I, as I we mentioned earlier, the research we have done is still very very short. We have not followed people out for a long period of time to see whether tra reduce the transmission or not. And of course, we cannot. The, the, the idea is we cannot do what we call a, a real real uh, intervention where we basically subject people to to expose to COVID nineteen and not expose to COVID nineteen. We can only do a, a naturally people naturally getting COVID-19. So a lot of things we cannot find out and that's the, in the research that we did. So we were not able to see whether there's reduced transmission. But we know that people who get the COVID-19 have reduced, chan reduced chance of getting the disease. If they get the disease, basically they, have, they are less severe disease. That is important. That is the important thing we, we have to understand. If everybody get vaccinated, then everybody will have a reduced chance of getting the disease and reduced chance of severity. And that is where we basically would, also, would in the long run, would reduce the transmission. But as I repeatedly say, we need everybody, we need 70% of the population to be immunized because we want herd immunity. In the meantime, even I, who has been immunized, I still have to practice hand hygiene, wear masks, physical distancing, ensure the surfaces are clean. I should avoid crowded places, confined spaces, and talking closely to one another without a mask on. I can only do that. I can only have I mean, confined space, crowded space, or talk without a mask on is if the other person has also received the vaccination. And that is not just received vaccination, I received my vaccination on Wednesday, I will still need to wait another two to three weeks before my immunity system actually develop enough antibodies to ensure that I basically are protected. So if another person is protected, another person is vaccinated, then we can actually take out our mask and go back to normal. Strategies to control 
COVID-19 vaccine, personal strategy, we must continue our personal strategy. Environment strategy is to ensure the environment is clean. If you have, if you are in a, in, in a closed environment, open the window, opening the window will allow fresh air to come in and the fresh air is important. If you cannot open a window because you are in an enclosed area, then a HEPA filter is basically also a good practice. But the HEPA filter must be able to large enough to ensure that the, it covers the whole space. Quarantine is the one that we're talking about early detection, isolation, and quarantine. The last is vaccine. We still, we, this is the strategies that we want want to basically look at how to control the uh, spread of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me. I will take questions and after this. Hope that you have find this useful. All right. Um, thank you so much, Prof. We do have uh, uh, quite a few questions uh, that have arrived. Um, <clears throat> Right, so uh, we take the first question. Uh, let me just go through them. Yeah, in order. Uh, the question is from um, Dr. Ajay. He's asking us that the current rise in cases seen in some countries, uh, is it being seen in people who are not vaccinated? Yes, most of the, most of the, most of the rise in cases are basically people who have not vaccinated. All right, of course, there are some some countries who have basically uh, a disease, a COVID-19 variant, basically are more trans transmissible. But if you see the countries that have been vaccinated, like uh, USA, uh, the, the numbers actually are coming down, but you cannot, you must basically, you must ensure that you must receive the, both the vaccine to actually achieve the immunity because only by uh, both the vaccine, you will basically be able to produce an antibodies to protect yourself. But also, you must understand that you need the uh, herd immunity. There should be many people get immunized, then the crisis will continue to fall. Yes, most of it are basically due to people not being immunized yet. True, true. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Moving on, Dr. Flores. Oh, well, I think Dr. Fawaz is, uh, can't hear him right now. I'll take the question. Um, as we have this question from uh, Mr. Uh, Kokhao, he asks us, as we have seen the virus developing new strains, will the virus mutation run or outrun the vaccine? Uh, not really. Basically, uh, research is being still being continued, all right? And if there's new strain and we find that the virus, the new, basically the idea is when we, when we develop the vaccine, all right, they look at some protein, all right? Because we know that the virus actually have many, many pro the protein is the, the DNA is the RNA is very, very long. So we, we don't talk, we don't take the whole RNA. We take a, we take a segment of the RNA that basically we say that these are the spike protein. These are the protein that they won't change over a period of long time. This is basically taken from research from previous research on COVID, uh, basically or called the coronavirus that we have before. So it won't, basically, it won't reduce the effectiveness of the vaccine. However, if there is chances that the virus have actually mutated so much that actually have changed the spike protein part and reduced the vaccine's uh, ability to produce uh, antibodies, then the, the research is continuing being done that we can actually yeah. use what you call booster doses, like what what because mra virus are very easy to manufacture and they can manufacture it using booster doses and then that booster dose will, will improve the uh immunity again thank you thank you professor uh the next question is coming from uh law chai hoon and uh asking if the covid 19 pandemic is well controlled in china is the herd immunity achieved by now in china uh not no, her, her, if her immunity, you need 70% uh, of the people to be either infected and get the disease or 70% of people vaccinated. It's, what is happening in China is basically people adhering to the SOP. All right. And basically, if you don't allow a disease to come in, it, it would not spread. The, the issue is that in Malaysia, 
why we get a high high number of cases is because there was a breach in the SOP at some point of time mm -hmm. and we allowed the disease to spread. And that basically is for us to control it back. It takes some time for us to basically find everyone. So the idea is that if you have good contact tracing, all right, you can identify every contact, then it, then you then you can control the disease. So to answer the, the question, no, China have not reached herd immunity. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is from uh, uh, Zizin Lim. She asks us, hi, doctor, may I ask about the side effects of vaccines on senior citizens and how to minimize the side effect on them, especially for those who are older than 80? Uh, basically, if you if anyone who wants to take vaccine, old or young, all right, must ensure that they declare all their side effects, mm -hmm. all their all their allergy, all their uh, previous medical condition. And once they declare that, the doctor who is basically assessing you will decide whether you can receive the vaccine or not. Whether you can receive, let's say, currently we're talking about uh, community, the mRNA vaccine, all right? Whether you can receive the mRNA vaccine or not. If you find that the, your risk is higher because of your earlier, uh, uh, basically your allergic condition, your earlier medical condition, then we will recommend you to take another type of vaccine. Oh. The Sinovax. Sinovax is different because it's a different type of vaccine and, and the community is different, it's a different type of vaccine. So the, the idea is make sure you declare your symptom, your illness to the doctor truthfully and clearly. They will decide and they will give you the choice to decide. So don't worry about that. Right, all the side effects that we see now basically, uh, uh, basic, most of it in bowel, and the major one is not 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 really is because of other other thing. It can be co coincidental. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. I think I just add to that question is that uh, because uh, Malaysia has uh, so many different vaccines, so the choice of vaccine is depending on the medical condition of the patient, or is it the government will decide which vaccine will go to uh, which citizen because it was a Quite a talk about it if we can choose which vaccine we want or something. The 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 vaccine depends on two things. All right, one thing is whether whether we have the we have the facilities to actually deliver the vaccine at that at that location or not. Secondly, is basically whether you you if you what's the risk of taking the vaccine. So the government won't decide. The Ministry of Health will decide. All right. So on whether what vaccine the doctor will decide on whether what vaccine you take, but. What vaccine actually reach you are taking, it doesn't matter, all right, because at the end, uh, any vaccine will give you some kind of uh, immunity. And it is all the vaccine are the same. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. There's another question by uh, Tyson Ehan, and uh, he's asking, Professor, vaccines from different companies and different com countries are shown to give different efficacy. Uh, why is that? Can you? Okay, the, the, the idea the, the idea of getting different efficacy from different vaccine, the main thing is we must look at it from as I mentioned earlier, when you do this when you do the research, all right, you do the research on you inject the vaccine, correct? To to an individual. And you and the, the individual must be exposed to COVID patient to get the disease. Correct. If a country the COVID cases are so low, there's no chances of of getting getting infected by COVID cases then it's very difficult for us to know whether what is good, what is how effective is the disease or not. That's why some countries have different results compared to other countries. Some vaccines have different results compared to other countries. Other, it's because the population that they choose, the population that they choose to study on, how basically what is the prevalence of the disease in the community at that point of time. So, so, so if the prevalence of the disease is high, and of, then you will get a better result because you have more people to compare and then your result better. But if your prevalent disease is low, then the variation is not there and that's, it's difficult. That's why it, it seems to be lower. But don't worry. It is just because of the design of design of the study and because of the number of uh, prevalent of the disease in the community at the point of time. It's not because it's lower. Or the vaccine, if you do it using this, if you do it the same population, it will show almost the same result. But because we're doing it at a different population with different prevalent, different number of cases in the community, that's why the, the result is different. 
Yeah, so that's a very interesting, um, I mean, in informative point. So uh, the, the uh, same person moves on, goes on to ask us, please comment on the relation of the Chinese vaccine on thrombosis. Chinese vaccine on thrombosis? <laughs> I thought I thought the thrombosis, not the Chinese vaccine, is another another yeah. vaccine. But it doesn't matter. Basically, basically there is no risk of thrombosis in, on on the vaccine itself. All right. I think yeah. I think there is some, some uh, rumors spreading around, all right. But the rumors have been proven proved it's, it's proven it's not it's not true. It's not from our doctor Suresh Kumar, all right. The, the one the doctor from Sungai Buloh Hospital. There's a rumor spreading yeah. around. It's not true. The issue is that if you have any medical condition, please inform to your to your doctor, mm -hmm. and your doctor will decide what is the best for you. All right. Not to say it's not the doctor will decide. The doctor will give you the opinion to decide. All right. The the thing is, basically, we like to we like the patient to make their own decision. I I think a very very important point. I think everybody is uninformed about this uh, situation where the medical condition has to be declared, and the doctor will consult with you before they actually give you the vaccine. Most of the people think you go to the vaccination center and then they'll just vaccinate you. Okay, so, I will tell I'll tell you what happened to me. I, when I go in, they will ask before even I go in, they will ask me, do do you have any any allergic condition or not? So I declare to them, I am allergic to lignocaine. Lignocaine is a is a is a local local anesthetic. All right. I say when I get lignocaine, I get itchiness everywhere. They ask you, do you have you developed any anaphylactic or not? I say, no, anaphylactic is basically a kind of shock. No. So okay, after they have assessed me, they say, okay, you are safe to take this vaccine. All right. Then the, on the day itself, they come, they, they tell me, do you have any allergic or not? I say yes. Okay, so you you have to wait for thirty minutes instead of fifteen minutes. So waited for thirty minutes, sitting down there, wait for thirty minutes. After thirty minutes, they will, they will come and see you. Are you okay or not? So if you are okay, then they let you go. If not okay, basically because we are in a hospital setting, they will actually admit you or or treat you or wait for you further. So by declare declare at every stage, they will ask you for your symptom. They ask to declare. They make sure that you declare correctly. They ask you again and again and again. Even on the on the second dose, they will ask you the first dose. What is your allergy? Do you have any problem or not? Have you have have you? So 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 that is important, Doctor Faraz. I think you are correct. You must declare, mm -hmm. and by declaring, by knowing, the doctor or will they, they will basically give you the best advice they can give. I mean that's superb. It's so well organized that uh, mm -hmm. you know you are well taken care of actually. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor. We'll uh, have another question. Um, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Prof has answered the question about uh, the drug allergy. Uh, if anybody has a drug allergy, are they encouraged to take the vaccine? So like Prof has already said, he has had a lignocaine and then they keep monitoring you. So that is okay. So we'll go to the next question uh by akmal and he's asking professor is there any significant uh, oral manifestation upon taking the vaccine i'm not sure about what's oral manifestation is that oral hygiene basically you're coming from that dentistry <laughs> i don't think so there's any oral oral complication all right you still you still can you still can you still can come to see a dentist after you take covid 19 vaccine that means right. the idea is that when you take the vaccine you won't get you won't get virus inside your mouth don't worry you you take the you take second vaccine also you don't get virus inside your mouth the problem we say that why why it might not might not prevent transmission is that when the virus go into your into your mouth it might develop inside there because you have not reached your reach your blood itself it might develop inside there that means the 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 protection might not happen here protection but it you won't develop the disease but the the virus might just might just multiply inside your mouth. That's why you can you can spread it, maybe. But that we don't know yet. That's why we have to we have to be more clear because research have not been done clearly yet. So don't worry. There's no oral health issue. You still can go and see a dentist. All right. Okay. All right. Moving on. A uh, question from uh, Priyanka. She asks us um, uh, if there's enough research being done to answer the question. If COVID vaccination is supposed to be taken annually, uh, not yet. But uh, as I say, we need, need a booster, and the what the important thing is, if COVID is not here anymore, we don't have to take anymore. Remember, remember the SARS SARS one. All right, we try to develop the COVID vaccine in two thousand and three, 
but I, anyhow it just really die off by itself it's not here anymore mm. so actually right. we we don't know that all right yeah so yeah. but if but we're not worried about it we're worried about other more the next next pandemic might be worse than this pandemic mm. because we are moving closer to animals they are taking up their their uh, territory so that's why there's be more diseases coming from animal to human correct thank you, yes uh there's a question there's uh, actually a question from uh, belinda rahim and she's asking she says that latest news shown that newborn baby is uh, immune to covid vaccine after the pregnant mother took the vaccine so does the vaccine weaken other types of vaccine the baby would take so the baby is born with the immunity with covid vaccine because the mother was immune uh, immunized now if the baby takes other vaccine would there be a conflict of interest <laughs> uh, there will be no conflict of interest don't worry because because baby that's why the newborn baby if the mother have been immunized newborn baby at the big at one one week time basically they are they have some protection already that's why you see not just newborn baby <laughs> protection if you take breast milk, all right you also have some protection because the the antibodies actually can travel from from mother to child that's why we encourage exclusive breastfeeding although this is not a breast milk uh, promotion but we encourage exclusive <laughs> breastfeeding for six months that's important no cow milk all right although just now i say mm -hmm. cow pox but no cow milk breast milk for six months all right so um uh, doctor i have a question myself prof if the person has been vaccinated uh, has taken the first dose and then before the second dose actually contracts the disease so would they have to wait to take the second dose or can it be scheduled at the same time and uh, would the uh, the disease that is manifested would have lesser um, uh, you know would not be full blown you know how much do we know about this we 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 don't know okay firstly firstly i we have or uh, uh, healthcare worker who have taken the first vaccine that three days later they have covid 19 all right we have uh. them all right so what happened is we treat them as after they recover then only we see whether they need the second dose but not not directly because they will have some immunity already correct okay so whether less disease or not that also we we don't know all right because we don't know when they get infected correct they can mm. be infected before the vaccine or during during the days before the the immunity actually develop because we know that immunity don't develop immediately it takes around one week to 10 days for the immunity to develop that period of time also we don't know so the idea okay, is okay. if you take the vaccine you get covid 19 you get treated for covid 19 okay. then until you recover and then we check whether you're in when we need to take the booster dose of course we know that those that COVID-19 still need to take the vaccine itself. But only we give you after you have recovered. Yeah. Yes. All right. So. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. I There's one more question. That will be the last question we'll take because the uh, Professor has a flight to catch and he is a very, very busy man, I'm telling you. So the question is coming from Akmal. Uh, he says, thank you, Doctor. So no correlation has been found between the oral mm -hmm. manifestation and the oral cavity, of course, the professor has already answered because we are still into the research stage. And till now, there is uh, no correlation found that you may have any oral manifestation. Uh, Tyson Ehan, a uh, quick question from him. Should those recovered from COVID take the vaccine? Yeah. Who recovered from COVID? COVID should take the vaccine. All right. I think there's no problem. I Sorry, sorry that sorry that I we cannot stay I cannot stay long to discuss with you. <laughs> I don't have a flight to cash. I just got to I got to check out from a hotel. So to just to inform you, I'm now in uh in 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 Kuala Selangor. So I'm basically I can travel within 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 uh, doing some local travel within Selangor. So I'm in <gasps> Selangor. So yeah. I did not cross the border. All right, don't don't, don't ask people to come and catch me. Just now you say I'm on the flight. I'm not on the flight. I got no. I got no. I got no authority to go on the flight now. You say that people come and come and catch me. No, no, no. I'm just saying, oh, I'm still in college. I'm just going to check out of the hotel. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks.
Thank sorry, you so sorry, much, Prof. You really, for a long time. yeah, but you really made things a lot more clearer for us, and uh, and you have a really uh, cheerful persona, and then you really uh, answered so many questions for us. Thank you so much for sparing your time. I hope. Thank you. I, I I'm glad I'll be I'm here. I think I think I'm glad that a lot of people have followed, and hopefully they will they will get something out of this. All right. So thank you again. Thank you for inviting me. I'll see you next time. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Professor. Thank you so much. Bye.